The XPS of copper finds it difficult to discern the difference between metallic forms of copper and copper 1 plus oxide. So to investigate this what we're going to do is perform a sequence of measurements where we have taken a copper 2 plus oxide and which has been sputtered using an argon iron gun and the idea is that at the center of this sputter zone we have metallic copper and as we move along a line scan we end up with the copper 2 plus and somewhere in between we have copper in a suboxide state and we've got data now that allows us to interrogate the changes in this material using OJ lines and we've also got valence band and a range of other measurements that we've performed but we're going to focus on the OJ lines right now and we've combined a pair of OJ measurements actually at different step sizes so that we didn't have to spend so much time acquiring the the, the broader features of these OJ lines and we could focus on these more characteristic shapes for the OJ line for metallic where we, we have some structure there that we would like to capture hence we've we've targeted our acquisition and we've now combined these data and performed a principal component analysis so that we can see how many abstract factors can be generated from these data and we can see there are between three and four abstract factors that might be significant to these OJ lines the 4 is probably related to the oxygen peak where we've got more going on in the copper 2 plus oxide than simply um, oxygen. We've, I think there's nitrogen and carbon also there so it's not surprising the oxygen peak is more involved. But using this PCA analysis we can do a noise reduction step so we can end up with a set of, of corresponding data where we've reduced the influence of noise on, on the data by reproducing using four abstract factors and the idea is that we can then perform some calculations and work out the different oxidation states for this copper and this applies to other materials here's an example of molybdenum we've got molybdenum OJ lines from a silver anode and they could be analyzed in a similar fashion to this copper and similarly you've got gold gold produces a sequence of OJ lines from a silver anode that allow us to work out the difference between oxidation states that might not exhibit in the normal photoemission lines. Although these data contain different shapes, what we're going to do now is use different spectra to work out more representative shapes for the different oxidation states of, of copper that, that we believe to be in here. So we've worked out a sequence of spectra that have been calculated from the two that were in the active tile and they represent a blend and a, and a difference of those blends of those spectra so that we can step through and look for shapes that maybe enhance the oxygen peak or remove the oxygen peak. In this example we've tried to produce a, a, a more pronounced oxygen peak so that this is going to be more characteristic of the copper suboxide that we anticipate and, and similarly we can look for another form another shape where we try to reduce the influence of the oxygen on the metallic form because there should be no oxygen and uh, unfortunately we can't actually remove the oxygen here we don't have uh, a good enough overlap between the different oxide and what we have on in the metallic form so we're going to have to accept a little bit of oxygen here but nevertheless we've been able to probably enhance in some way the metallic shapes in the OJ lines so we're going to save these two and you can see that already from this calculation we've got quite different shapes here for the metallic and this suboxide so the next step we need to do having copied those through to the original data set um, is now look for the copper 2 plus type shape and we'll do this by choosing two that are mostly copper 2 plus that's at the end of the line scan and one that's that's got some 2 plus in it and is near the edge of the sputter zone so we do the same calculation we do different spectra 
and we can look through and again you can see clearly we've got an oxygen peak that is showing much information about the oxygen and therefore we think we've got the something that is characteristic of this copper 2 plus and again we have to then use an element of judgment here but in reality the choice of this line shape has been determined by repeatedly performing these these data treatment experiments and using the 2p the uh, 3p the valence band and so you build up a picture of what it ought to look like for this particular type of copper oxide so having chosen one of these we'll, we'll just go and have a look at what this same calculation will do for uh, the interpretation of, of the suboxide so we're going to step through and past the influence of the 2 plus and see if we can remove an, an amount of 2 plus from uh, the, the suboxide that we selected and come up with a an OJ line shape that ought to be similar, very similar to the one that we calculated from the metallic and the copper 1 plus or the copper 1 plus like suboxide and having done that we can copy these through to the original data set and we'll just do a little comparison to to make sure that what we've done so far makes sense so overlaying the data and comparing we need to select from this set of four we need to select three line shapes that we can use as the basis functions to reproduce the original data so having made a choice what we're going to do is overlay the three basis functions in the active tile and these three look like we've got very significant changes in shape for these OJ lines so we we believe we're going to produce something that will reproduce these data these are the original raw data and we want to overlay the basis functions in the active tile select the raw data and then we'll perform a linear least squares analysis which will create a table that will decompose the, the data into the three components that we had displayed in the active tile. So each row is a linear least squares solution within this uh, new file. And the idea is that the first column is the raw data, the second one is a linear least squares solution and then we've got three basis functions in the next three columns and what we're going to do is profile using these linear least square solutions the these spectra by creating regions for the basis functions that um, are aimed at a particular uh, peak and you can see that we've actually reproduced the data very nicely and it's much smoother than the data itself and that's because of the PCA calculation if we hadn't done a PCA calculation you'd have found that the the basis functions would have been much noisier but because we had such a large data set we were able to remove an element of the noise because we really had invested a significant amount of time in the acquisition process that if you just focused on one particular spectrum you would you would uh, not take advantage of that acquisition time but the PCA has been able to do that so adding these regions now for the OJ peak and this we've just chosen the primary OJ peak here well actually the peaks should we say uh, many peaks beneath these very complex structures you never want to peak fit these but we can put regions on estimate the intensity associated with these different OJ structures and then we can create a profile and in order to do the profile we want to name the different regions so that when we create a quantification table uh, the the traces all have the appropriate names and we need to propagate these to all of the these regions that we just created to all the um, three columns of basis functions so we overlay the base the regions spec with regions in the active tile and then we'll use the propagate and match so that we pass the appropriate region to the appropriate column in the right hand side and having done that we can then create a profile table and then we can create from that table the profile itself and it is now clear that we have been able to differentiate 
nicely between the metallic form, the suboxide and also the copper 2 plus.